Hi, I'm Rod Saunders from Jew and Greek. Well, Justin Peters has accepted my challenge to prove that Word of Faith teachers have said that Jesus is a created being. In case you're not familiar with it, this is what he said in a recent video followed by my challenge. R.C. Sproul taught um, amillennialism, which I disagree with, or he taught infant baptism, which I definitely disagree with. That doesn't make him a false teacher mm -hmm. because um, he was... He was right on who God is, he was right on who Jesus is, he was right on who the Holy Spirit is, he was right on the gospel, he was right on salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. He did not teach that Jesus is a created being like many word faith preachers do. He, does not, he did not teach modalism uh, like many word faith teachers do, some anyway. So he didn't, he didn't teach heresy. So it's a, it, it's, a, it's a leap that you really should not make to say, that because someone teaches something that is false, mm -hmm. then that automatically makes them a false teacher as we understand the term. Okay, no Word of Faith teachers that I know of have ever stated that Jesus is a created being. And I would challenge Justin to provide any evidence to support that claim. Challenge accepted. So in his video, he offered three examples from Kenneth Copeland, Perry Stone, and Jesse Duplantis. So here's the first one. God was making promises to Jesus, and Jesus wasn't even there. God was making promises to Jesus, and Jesus wasn't even there. Well, where was he? Well, apparently, he did not yet exist. So Copeland said that God was making promises to Jesus and Jesus wasn't even there. Now, I think that most people would interpret that not as a denial of the pre-incarnate Jesus or the eternality of Jesus, but as a reference to the incarnation, which was still thousands of years in the future. You'll notice that he didn't say Jesus is a created being. That was the challenge, and all Justin produced was a quote that he interprets that way. Here's his next piece of evidence. This from his book, The Power of the Tongue, pages 8 through 10. Jesus existed only as an image in the heart of God until such time as the prophets of the Old Testament could positively confess Jesus into existence through their constant prophecies. What do you do with that? Okay, he shows a quote attributed to Kenneth Copeland from his book, The Power of the Tongue. Now, when I saw the part about positively confessing Jesus into existence, I didn't think that sounded right. I don't think Copeland would have said it that way. It sounded to me like a summary of what Copeland said done by some discernment hack. So I googled that line and found a couple of discernment sites with that quote just the way Justin presented it. Then I looked around and found a digital copy of the book, The Power of the Tongue, because I don't typically buy Kenneth Copeland's books, and I searched in it for the word positively. As you can see, I got zero results. So that quote wasn't in the book. As I suspected, it was a critic's paraphrase. This is essentially what Justin did when I challenged him to provide evidence that Benny Hinn said that he conjures up the ghost of Catherine Kuhlman to get instructions for his ministry. He gave me a link to a blog where another Benny Hinn critic made the same allegation. But all that did was prove that somebody else made the allegation. It didn't prove that the allegation was true, and neither does this alleged quote of Kenneth Copeland. Here's what he did say in the book. Once that covenant was established, God began to release his word into the earth. He began to paint a picture of a redeemer, a man who would be the manifestation of his word in the earth. The only avenue God had to get his words into the earth was through men. As he would speak life-filled words in relation to his covenant with Abraham, his prophets would repeat those words in the earth. It was a very tedious and difficult process since the Old Testament prophets were not born again men. Because they lived under the Abrahamic covenant, they were able to receive instruction from God and righteousness was imputed or counted unto them, Romans 4.22. So before Jesus came to the earth, 
God spoke his word and then spoke his word again. How many times did he say the Messiah was coming? It was prophesied over hundreds, even thousands of years. He kept saying, he is coming, he is coming. The circumstances in the earth made it look as if there was no way he could accomplish it. But he just kept saying it. He would not be moved by what he saw. Once that word was received into the earth by a man, it was here to stay. In Isaiah 55, 11, God said, So shall my word be that goeth forth from out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. God would not relent. Through the mouths of his prophets, he kept sending his word and sending his word, Finally, the great moment came when that word was brought forth in human form and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we have beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. John 1, 14. The word which existed before the foundations of the earth lived for 33 years as a man. His name was Jesus. He ministered for three years as a prophet under the Abrahamic covenant. Then he gave himself to be the last sacrifice of the old covenant. He became the sacrificial lamb offered upon the altar of the cross for one reason, to defeat Satan. So not only is that quote missing from the book, he clearly stated that the word was brought forth in human form and that the word existed before the foundation of the earth. Here's what Copeland's statement of faith says. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, creator of all things. Now, how could Jesus be the creator of all things if he didn't exist until the incarnation? So not only did Justin fail to provide evidence that Copeland said that Jesus is a created being, he also provided a non-existent quote and failed to provide the actual quote, which is contradictory to his claim. I'm going to buy a copy of the book just to make sure that my research is accurate because I'm meticulous about these things. If I found out that my initial research is wrong, I'll do a follow-up video and let you know. So now on to the Perry Stone quote. So Moses is telling Jesus about his death. So what does Moses know about Jesus' death? Because when Moses died, Jesus didn't even exist. Jesus didn't come into existence to 1,500 years later. When Moses died, Jesus didn't even exist. Jesus didn't come into existence until 1,500 years later. Well, if he didn't exist, he had to be created, right? Same thing with uh, what we saw from Kenneth Copeland. Now, lest you think, okay, that was just, um, he didn't really mean that Jesus didn't exist. It just He just meant that Jesus wasn't on earth yet, wasn't, um, the incarnation had not yet taken place. That's what he meant. Yeah, that's exactly what he meant. He made the statement twice. When Moses said this, Jesus didn't exist. He didn't exist. He repeated it. He didn't exist until 1,500 years later. Because when Moses died, Jesus didn't even exist. Jesus didn't come into existence to 1,500 years later. I'm not sure what the context was based on that short clip, but I seriously doubt that he was doing a lecture on Christology. Again, I would interpret that as a reference to the incarnation, not a denial of the pre-incarnate existence of the Son of God or the Logos. He didn't say that Jesus is a created being. And again, that was the challenge. He said something that Justin is interpreting that way. Here's what Perry Stone's statement of faith says. We believe that there is one true eternal God, the Almighty Father, the creator of the heavens and the earth. We believe that he is revealed in three persons as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Nothing in there about Jesus being a created being. Now, Perry Stone is part of the Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee. Here's what their statement of faith says. We believe in one God eternally existing in three persons, namely the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So the Father exists eternally, which means that Jesus isn't a created being. And by the way, I'm not sure that Perry Stone would identify as word of faith. He's certainly Pentecostal, but that doesn't mean that he's word of faith. Lots of Assembly of God and Church of God people oppose Word of Faith teaching. So I think Justin is making an assumption there, too. So now, on to Jesse Duplantis. You know, God never created Christianity. Man did that. God created Christ. God sowed Christ so he could have Christians. 
God created Christ. So Jesse also didn't say that Jesus is a created being, although I think he probably came closer than the other two. He said that God created Christ. Now, Christ is a reference to Jesus, the man who was prophesied and eventually was born into this world as the Savior. So saying that God created Christ isn't a denial of the eternality of the Son of God. It's, again, a reference to the incarnation. Here's what Jesse DePlanis' statement of faith says. We believe in the triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's brief, but it doesn't say anything about Jesus being created. To the contrary, it states a conventional view of the Trinity. The belief that Jesus is a created being is referred to as Arianism, named after a 4th century priest named Arius. He was condemned as a heretic, and ever since, the church world has condemned the view that Jesus was a created being, rather than a co-eternal member of the Godhead. All three of these examples Justin provided were just referring to the incarnation rather than promoting Arianism. The reason I stated so confidently that Word of Faith teachers don't teach Arianism is because I attended Kenneth Hagin's school, and I know that he had a mainstream view on the Trinity and Christology. He was ordained with the Assemblies of God for 30 years, and their views on essential doctrines like these are considered mainstream by the evangelical world. And Kenneth Hagin was the man that most all of the Word of Faith teachers looked to as the leader of the movement and as their mentor. That doesn't mean that everything they say and do accurately reflects his teaching, but on the essential doctrinal issues, I think they're on the same page. So Justin took me up on the challenge and failed to provide any quote of them saying that Jesus isn't eternal or that he is a created being who became a god or that they affirm Arianism or anything of the kind. Instead, he just defaulted to condemnation mode, applying the worst possible interpretation of what they said in an extemporaneous speaking situation, which is standard operating procedure for heretic hunters. Thanks for watching and be blessed.